Welcome to the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions webinar series. I'm Dirk Ficke and I serve as Executive Director for the Council. Following today's presentation, we'll have time to take questions from our listeners. And at any point during the webinar, you may type questions into the box on your screen. Today we're honored uh, to welcome Kay Lindahl, who will present a webinar entitled The Sacred Art of Listening. Ms. Lindahl is a certified listening professional and the founder of the Listening Center. She is recognized as an inspiring teacher and spiritual guide for people of all religious backgrounds, and she conducts workshops and retreats around the world on the sacred art of listening for religious, spiritual, educational, <laughs> health services, community, and business groups. Kay is also a dedicated spokesperson for the interfaith movement and currently serves on the board of directors for Women of Spirit and Faith and the Immortal Chaplains Foundation. She is a past trustee of the Global Council of the United Religions Initiative, former chair of the North American Interfaith Network, and currently an ambassador for the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions. Kay, it's great to have you this morning. Thank you, Dirk. It's wonderful to be here. I'm really delighted to be able to uh, be with everyone this morning and, and discuss this topic that's so close to my heart, the sacred art of listening. So first, I'd like to welcome you all to the Listening Center. For the next hour, I invite you to think of this space, wherever you are, as a center for listening. And I invite you to consider that the Listening Center is really your center. It's that innermost part of you where in the silence you remember who you are. You tap into your own inner wisdom and you become the center for listening. So today we're going to explore that center by engaging in a conversation on the sacred nature of listening and practices that support becoming a listening presence. To give you an idea of how the morning, how the time is going to go, I'm going to start with some background information, then I'll introduce three concepts that set a context for deep listening, and then I'll end with a conversation about three practices that can enhance our capacity to listen deeply. I invite you to think of this time together as an exercise in deep listening. It's a time to focus on listening with awareness and attention. Then at the end of our time together, there will be access to a handout, which will give you a detailed summary of what I am covering today. What I've discovered in my experience over the years is that it makes much easier for you to focus on listening if you're not reading at the same time. Now I'd like you to imagine that we're sitting together in a circle. And one of my practices when I do this work is to light a candle and place it in the center of the circle. Light is a symbol for many religions of spirit, God, source, creator, divine. And I like to use a candle to remind us to look for the light in each other and as also as a way to center us and to ground us and to connect us as we gaze at the light. So imagine right now, and I'm doing this literally, I'm lighting, I'm striking a match and I'm lighting a candle. So this candle is now beside me where I am and if you can imagine that it's now in the center of the room so that we have a candle uh, with us together as we're working. So the background of this work is part of my spiritual journey including over 20 years in the interfaith movement and I have spent the past 15 years of that time really focusing on the art of listening. When people find out about my work or the names of my books one of the first things they say to me is, that's wonderful. We could all learn how to listen better. Followed almost immediately by, would you talk to my husband, my wife, my partner, my sister, my brother, my aunt, my boss? It seems like everyone has at least one other person that they would like to listen to them better. Now, if this is really true, and we step back a little, just maybe it means that we are that someone for someone else. And we all really do need to learn how to listen better. 
it seems like there's a universal yearning to be heard. How did we get to this place? There may be many reasons for it, but I've discovered that there are a couple of major reasons. And one of them has to do with values. And the other one has to do with behavior. So first, the values. If we think of speaking and listening as the two major components of communication, speaking is the one that most people think of as it has the most powerful role. It certainly gets the most attention. Have you ever heard of someone saying, that was a really, oftentimes we'll hear someone say, that was a really powerful speech. But I seldom hear anyone saying, gee, that was a powerful way that you listened to me. But wasn't that listening wonderful in that room? The quality of our listening can really make a profound difference in any conversation. There's a wonderful quote by a, a Quaker author by the name of Douglas Steer. And he says this. To listen another soul into a condition of disclosure and discovery may be almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. I'm going to say that again because I think it's so powerful. To listen another soul into a condition of disclosure and discovery may be almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. As we open up to listening as this kind of profound spiritual practice, we find that it inspires our spiritual growth, nurtures our inner voice, and transforms all our relationships. The second reason I think we've lost this art of listening is it has to do with behavior. And we've learned some bad listening habits over the years. Research on listening indicates that we spend about 80% of our waking hours communicating. We're writing about 9% of the time. We're reading about 16% of the time. We're speaking about 25% of the time. And we're actually listening about 50% of the time, whether it's to people or music or radio or television. However, about 75% of that time that we are engaged in listening, we are not paying attention. We're forgetful. We're preoccupied. So we're really not fully present for that 50% of the time when we're listening. One of the factors that influence this statistic in the United States, anyway, is that research has, has indicated that the average attention span for an adult in this country is about, and this will probably surprise many of you, 22 seconds. It's no surprise to me to note that the length of most television commercials is around 15 to 30 seconds. So sometimes I wonder which came first. Did, have we been trained to listen, focus for just 22 seconds, or is that just the natural way for human beings? But the constant change of focus makes it more difficult to listen for any significant length of time. Immediately after we hear someone speak, we remember about half of what they have said. And a few hours later, that goes down to about 10%. And yet, less than 5% of us have ever concentrated on developing our skills in listening. Another factor in this dilemma is the advent of the information age and the, and the revolution of technology. In a way, they are a mixed blessing. They've certainly made us aware of our global community and given us the tools to communicate with each other 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They've also influenced how we listen. In years past, most people ate dinner together where they learned the art of communication, including listening. We also had more silence in public spaces and time to listen. Even television movies had more silence in them, a time to absorb and listen. If you watch old movies or old television shows, you'll notice that the actors spoke more slowly. There was more time in between in dialogue. Silence was common in them. There was less be time to really absorb what was being said. And again, watching television today offers poor examples of listening, with lots of interrupting and shouting and not paying attention to the speaker. So it seems like we have no really consistent models of good listening. So when people hear these ideas, they often say to me, well, that's so interesting. 
I know that I spend hours preparing to speak. I don't ever think I've consciously prepared to listen. To listen. It's like listening has become a lost art. I've tried to define what I mean by the art of listening and it, over these past 15 years, and I was hoping to come up with a one-sentence definition, but that hasn't happened. So I have four-sentence definition, and this will be in the handout that you can access after the end of the, this program. So the first one is that the art of listening is, number one, it's becoming a listening presence. And that might become more clear to you after we've gone through this program, what I mean by that word. I listen present. Two, it's a way of being that opens us up so we can listen to people from diverse backgrounds, cultures, religions, and belief systems, those not like us. Three, it's about being a presence for understanding rather than for judging. And four, it's about being open, curious, and attentive to others in such a way that at the end of any conversation, they feel more fully expressed and alive. So that's a lot of ideas to incorporate in one definition. And yet, there is a, it, that old listening is such a vast subject that I think we really do really get almost everything about listening and what makes it into an art. When we understand that sacred aspect of listening, we become aware of what a key it is to communication in our global community. Now, many of you here today may have participated in listening workshops or classes before. So I invite you to be here with the possibility that you might add to your listening skills or learn something new to support you in your daily life and work. So as we start our time together, I invite each of you to think of a person or a group of people or a situation in your life that you most want to impact with the quality of your listening? Now that's kind of a different question to ask. Most of the time we think of how can I make a difference in, the, in, in what I say? What can I say that will make a difference? So I'm asking you this time to think about something. How can I listen? How can I impact the situation by the way that I listen? So once you have that person or group of people or that situation in mind, keep them in the background as you participate in our time together today with the intention that something will show up for you. You will learn something that is relevant and useful for you the next time you are in that situation or with those people. Now we're going to hit the concepts. What I've learned over these past few years is that the work I do is all about teaching people how to prepare to listen, to become a listening presence. I had originally thought that what I was teaching people was how to listen, but I, over the years I've discovered that this work really is about preparing to listen. And we're all familiar with classes on how, you, how to prepare to speak. Public speaking classes are very common and it's very much emphasized in our classrooms and in, in universities and any any time any job that you have people talk about what are your what are your speaking skills. But how about a class in preparing to listen? Maybe we should have a class that's on public listening. I believe that to become this listening presence we really do need to prepare. Not only to listen to others, but also to listen to ourselves and to listen to that which is beyond our individual selves, which we call source or God or spirit something beyond our, our normal or ordinary self. Just as we take time to write and practice and polish a speech, I am suggesting that value in taking time to practice ways of preparing to listen. And there are only three practices, silence, reflection, and presence. But before introducing these practices, there are some concepts that I want to talk about, about listening, that provide us with a context for that work. They offer different ways of thinking about listening, which offer, open up for us new ways to understand listening and its sacred nature. So there are three basic concepts. And the first is that listening is an art. The second listening is a choice. And the third listening is a gift. So we're going to talk about listening as an art first. So listening is more than hearing words. It's more than an act. It's an art. Now what do we mean by that word, art? 
many times when I say that word, people think of drawing or painting or music or literature or dance. But I'm also thinking about the art of coaching or the art of teaching, maybe the art of preaching, the art of medicine. We talk about other things as an art. And what do we really mean when we say those words? Well, for me, I think what we mean is there's an at-oneness. When someone is really engaged in an art, they are at one with it. And there's an at-oneness that, about that experience. So I invite you to think about a time now when someone was truly listening to you, not figuring out what they were trying to going to say next, wishing you would hurry up, or mentally reviewing a to-do list, that they were simply there, present, with you, listening. What did that feel like? Think about what that felt like. Most people tell me that they feel understood, they feel refreshed, they feel connected, they feel whole. Some people say they feel healed. Uh, there's something about this listening presence, about being fully present with another person when we're listening to them, that, that is what we, are, I think, longing for when we say we want others to listen to us. And we've lost this art in our fast-paced culture of doing, keeping schedules, standing to overflowing email, all our cell phones and smartphones and Twitter and texting, and it goes on and on. But if we think about listening as an art, it's a shift away from what we, the way we usually think about it. It's a shift from thinking of listening as an act, something we do, to listening as an art, something that we be. It's a being rather than a doing. So then we're going to go on to the second concept. The second concept is that listening is a choice. Most of the time, we are completely unaware that we are choosing to listen or not. Have you ever had the experience of listening to someone and all of a sudden you realize you just haven't heard a word for the past minute or so? Your attention is no longer with the other person. You have unconsciously chosen not to listen. Sometimes it's easier to notice our conscious choices. If we don't want to hear what someone else is saying, we can tune them out in an instant. Sometimes it's because we're uncomfortable or not interested in the topic. Sometimes it's because we know that we should listen, but there's something in us that has the sense that if we really do listen to the other person, it may change our minds about the way we think about something or the way we feel about something, and we're just not quite ready or willing to do that yet. Another reason why we choose not to listen is when there is something so profound going on in our own lives that there's simply not room to take in anything else. It can be something of a joyous nature. It can be something of a, a business concern. It can be something of a, a, a difficulty in, in your life. But there's something very profound going on in your own life. And that really, you cannot take anything in at that point in time. Listening is not passive. It is not simply be, being quiet or even hearing the words. It's an action. And it takes energy to listen. And once we become aware that listening is a choice, we will notice that we have many opportunities to practice choosing in our daily lives. It's really a powerful awakening. One other thing I want to say about listening as a choice before, before we move on is that Sometimes we, we forget that we can set boundaries in our listening, because this comes up a lot when people ask me questions about this. So there's a, if someone comes in and says that they, they need to talk to you and, and you don't have time at that particular moment because you're engaged in something else, just to be able to say, I really do want to listen to you, but at this point in time I have to get this project done. Could we meet in five minutes? Or could we talk in ten minutes? Sometimes it's... it's People would rather have you do that than listen, half listen to them and half be thinking about what it is that you're going to be finishing, what project you're working on. So if you really think about it, that listening is a choice, it gives us some power in terms of choosing to listen or choosing not to listen and letting those in our lives know that, that what we're doing and why and setting up the time when we can listen to them. The third concept is that listening is a gift. And it's perhaps one of the greatest gifts we give to one another, is listening to each other with total attention. Remember what it was like when I asked you a moment ago to think about someone who was listening to you like this. 
it really is a profound experience. And both the listener and the speaker expand their sense of connection and of closeness. When two people listen to each other deeply, we sense that not only are we present to each other, we are present to something beyond the two of us. Some might call that spiritual or holy. I call that sacred. Artists often refer to this as an aesthetic rapture, and mystics call it ecstasy. Athletes call it being in the zone. Jazz musicians say they're in the groove. It's as though time stands still, still, and we are simply being in the experience. It is a gift beyond measure. Martin Buber talks about this in, in this way. He says, when two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. These experiences can be very transformational in nature. You might also have had the experience of someone thanking you for all of the help you gave them at, at a particular point in their lives. And you're wondering what they're talking about because you can't remember doing anything. You had simply given them the gift of your listening, and you were being a listening presence with them. Once we think about listening as a gift that we are either giving or receiving, it shines a new light on the value of listening. It's almost like giving us permission to slow down and savor the conversation, either by opening up to receive the gift or by extending the hospitality of giving the gift. So to summarize these three concepts, listening is half of all communication. It is the forgotten part of most presentations and conversations. But knowing that listening is an art and that we have a choice to give that gift, we can now engage in some practices that prepare us to access the art of listening. I use the word practices deliberately as one of the keys to developing the capacity to listen more deeply. It is a daily practice. Most of us know that if we want to excel at something, we need to practice. Think of all the time that musicians or dancers or athletes spend practicing or training. It is the daily practice, the spiritual discipline, that we prepare ourselves to access listening as an art. I like to use the example of dancers. Dancers refer to this as, as muscle memory. The daily and moves that they have to use in a dance anchors those movements in the muscle so that when it's time for the performance, the dancer no longer has to think about each individual move. The muscles remember what to do, and the dancer can just simply be in the dance dancing. It's the same for listening. If we engage in these listening practices six single day, the discipline, then when we need to listen deeply, we will be able to focus on the speaker, fully present and aware of what they are saying and who they are being. We can receive their communication totally open, even if we hold the opposite point of view. It is critical in learning how to understand the other. So the three practices that we will be talking about are cultivating silence, slowing down to reflect, and becoming present. There's a Cuban proverb that says, listening looks easy, but it's not simple. Every head is a world. And I love this thing. I think it really, I have this image of people walking around with globes on their heads, but it po just points to the fact that each one of us sees the world through our own head, through our own eyes. And to understand the other, we have to come out of our own, our own view and see if we can understand someone else's world view. So one of the initial practices is silence. There is no listening without silence. Cultivating silence is the practice. Learning to listen to the silence. Listening beyond words. It's sometimes I call it contemplative listening. It's about taking time to be quiet and simply be. Again, we're so busy running around doing things all the time. And this practice is to stop doing for a moment, to be quiet, to learn to listen to the silence. 
one of the things that I think about when I uh, in silence is how farmers will in in the in the old days anyway in the farming every they would leave one of their fields fallow every year they would plow it but they wouldn't plant in it so it would allow that field time to be re-nurtured by the soil to be nurtured again so that the next time they planted the seed would fall into richer soil I believe that silence is that for our soul that we really our souls crave that silence we need that kind of space and, and quiet so that we can be enriched and come back out and be more effective in our action in the world. So what can we do to cultivate silence and listen for that wisdom? First of all, notice how much noise there is in your life. Notice all the external distractions. The simple task of creating, creating this awareness can inform you of ways to incorporate silence. Maybe there's things that you can turn off. Maybe there's different places that you can go where you, you can find a more quiet environment. The more, we need to practice being, being silent. I suggest that you begin with simply one minute a day when you are intentionally silent. Listen. Notice what you hear. Just be in that quiet. Be intentionally silent. That's, that's a practice. Some of you may already have contemplative practices where you were in the silence more than that, which is wonderful. But to begin with, for many people, even a minute seems like a lot. So I might the suggestion is if you don't have a contemplative practice to just start cultivating silence. Start with a minute a day. The more comfortable we come with silence, the more it shifts from something empty or lonely and to be avoided into something rich and filled with life and yearn for. Getting comfortable with silence is a practice that will transform your capacity to listen. The next quality is reflection. And the practice is slowing down to reflect. Reflective listening is listening to yourself, your true self, that inner voice, getting to know the voice of your soul. When we deepen our relationships to ourselves, we develop a sensitivity to listen to that own, our own inner voice. And once we learn to know and trust this voice, we find ourselves able to recognize when we need to speak and when we need to listen. There's a Quaker saying, it's a sin to speak when you're not moved to speak. It's also a sin not to speak when you're moved to speak. So how do we know when we're moved to speak and when, when we're not moved to speak? Well, that's what reflection teaches us. It, reflection teaches us to recognize what we were being called to do, listen or speak. There's also a Sufi thing that relates to this aspect of reflective listening. Before speaking, ask yourself these three questions. Are these words true? Are these words necessary? Are these words kind? Only when the answer is yes to all three is it that speech is as good as silence. So how do we get to know this inner voice? It's a practice of listening for the question. Take a few breaths before responding to a situation, question, or comment. Ask yourself, what wants to be said next? Or what wants to be done next? Not what do I want to say next, or what do I want to do next, but what wants to be said next? Or what wants to be done next? Most of us don't think about that. Just in that little switch of asking that question, in this what wants to be said next, it causes us to slow down a little bit. It allows us to reflect a little bit. It allows us to listen for that wisdom. It's a slowing down. It's a waiting. It's a practicing patience. On the other side of that is when someone else is speaking and you are the listener, ask that person when they finish talking, is there anything else? And then wait. Just a couple seconds. Almost always there is. But we haven't. We don't. We don't get to finish our, our conversations because we're all in such a hurry to go on to the next one and go back and forth. So just slowing down to reflect, taking some time, asking yourself the question: What wants to happen next? What wants to be said next? Is a way. Is a practice. A daily practice in just cultivating the slowing down to reflect. The third practice is becoming present. Listening from the heart, listening which connects us. 
deep listening occurs at the heart level. It is present when we feel most connected to another person or group of people. Our hearts expand and our capacity to communicate with those of different beliefs and customs increases. I also think about this kind of listening as, become, as hospitality. It's offering someone the space where change can take place, where there's a freedom to be, where people can simply be who they are, be themselves. It's being fully present with another. And I call this heart listening. Now, a practice that supports this kind of listening is called a mindful minute. And it, again, it's just a minute a day. It can be as simple as sitting down and noticing what is happening moment by moment. Take some routine task that we do every day, whether it's eating or brushing your teeth or preparing a meal, driving your car, getting dressed, something that you do kind of as a routine that you don't really pay too much attention to anymore. Then at this practice is to be aware of what you're doing for each second of that minute. Stay in the present tense. For example, if I was going to say I was going to eat breakfast, I'd say I'm walking into the kitchen, I'm opening the cupboard, I'm taking out a glass, I'm opening the refrigerator, I'm taking out some juice. Whatever it is that you're doing, say it to yourself just for that 60 seconds of the day. People who take on this practice sometimes tell me that it's the only minute that they remember of the whole day. We're so used to multitasking and doing more than one thing at a time that we're never fully present with anything. There's a, a new um, syndrome that's been described. It's called CPA, Continuous Partial Attention, that we are constantly paying partial attention to everything and not paying full attention to anything. It's also called an absent presence. Sometimes people also use it when you're on the phone or when you're talking to somebody, uh, you can hear them, the clutter in the background of them uh, still on, the, on their computers, they call that the surfer's voice, that they're surfing the internet or surfing their, their uh, computers while they're supposedly listening to you. This exercise of taking a mindful minute trains our concentration so that we can learn how to be in that present moment. So just to summarize this a little bit, really listening to one another is one of the greatest gifts that we have to give. It really it requires our full attention. It calls for this mindset of appreciation and curiosity and wonder of the other person, especially people that we know really well. We think we know what they're going to say, or someone has a particular opinion on something. We think we know where they're going to go. It's a real good training to listen to them with that sense of curiosity and wonder. Is that what they're going to say? I don't know what they're going to say. Let me listen carefully here. We can't be thinking about what we're going to be saying in response or how we would handle a situation while we're listening. We need to be open to communicating from the heart. And it really it takes practice to let go of our own agendas to listen to another. Because we, everybody, we all have opinions on things. And the practice here is to be able to let go of that just for the moment while you're listening and being fully present with the other person. So I want to recap what we've talked about so far before we get to your questions. And there are the three ways to think about listening. Those are the concepts I talked about. Listening is a, an art, it's a choice, and it's a gift. And then we have three qualities to practice every single day. First is cultivating silence. Spend some time every day in silence. And I recommend at least a minute a day in silence. And sometimes that can be expanded to many minutes a day. But just start with a minute if, that's, if you're not used to that. And use this intention to listen. Listen for God, listen for source, listen for wisdom. Make it a daily practice. The second one is slowing down to reflect. And taking a deep breath before you respond. Listening to your soul, getting to know yourself. And the third is becoming present. Be mindful of the moment. Pay attention. Be with the person you are with. And there may be some daily practices that you might want to take on as well, you know, that you might notice when you choose to listen, when you choose not to listen. Notice what it's like to give the gift of listening to someone else and what it's like to receive it. 
notice when you start to interrupt someone and what happens when you don't. Notice what happens when someone stops speaking and you ask, is there anything else? Notice what happens when you let go of your agenda to be present with another. For me, listening is really about opening up to love and that my favorite quote of all time is one by a man by the name of David Augsburger and he says, being listened to is so close to being loved that most people cannot tell the difference. I'd like to leave you with that thought and open it up for questions and see what, what you think, what has been stirred up in you by listening to this so far. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Kay. Uh, we are going to have time for a few questions from our listeners. And again, I want to invite you to type your questions into the box on your screen. And gosh, we've already received questions from a number of places in the world. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll move these questions from the personal uh, to the social. From several people, uh, this is not a surprise, how can we help people listen to each other when they are angry? That's a great question. <clears throat> and of course, when people are angry, they have, there are lots of uh, emotions involved here. One of the, the, there are a couple things that come to my mind about this. And one of them is that uh, as a listener, when people are, when you're in a situation where people are angry, uh, one of the things that you can do as a listener is to have the intention of really hearing what these people have to say. There's something very powerful about being that listening presence when people are angry and just not responding, simply there open and letting go of your own agenda to simply be present with other people. Uh, we, we did this practice actually at the, the last parliament in Melbourne. There were a group of us who had something we called the Listening Project and we had met uh, over the phone previously to about, I think about a year before the parliament, we started having monthly phone calls to prepare ourselves for this. And we, there was one of the people in that group who had an experience at the parliament. She said there were people that were at the, and off in a corner and she saw that they were starting to get heated. And she just went over there and sort of stood there with the intention of listening as a peaceful practice. And she just stood there and she listened and listened and listened and didn't participate in the conversation, but she just kind of stood there as a listening presence. And it seemed to dissipate some of the anger and people seemed to be able to come to a different conclusion than they might have. And you know, we don't know for sure what happened there, but I think there is something about being that listening presence. The other thing about that, it, it, it goes back to that first quote about Douglas Steer to listen to another soul and to save discovery and disclosure. The way we listen can really impact what the result of a conversation. Uh, it's almost like a friend of mine has, has said it this way, that we become midwives for other people's thought. The quality of our listening can really impact the situation such that people will respond differently from what the way they might have if it hadn't been for the quality of our listening. It's, it's, it's hard to quantify that, and yet I know it works. I've seen it so many times. So those are some of the things. And the other thing about when people are angry, um, well, there's several things. There are so many parts to this. Uh, but one of the things is that when people are angry, sometimes they do just, they need to just, li they need to just say what they have to say in, in that anger. Um, Something else that, that happens if we if we if there's a way to set up a conversation so that there are some guidelines for the conversation, sometimes that helps dissipate the anger before it gets to that that point where it really seems explosive. There are probably lots of other things we could talk about there, but that's those are some of the first thoughts that come to my mind about angry. Uh, thank you, Kay. Uh, the the second question kind of follows along uh, in that and maybe piggybacks on your last uh, thought there. Um, what are the elements of an environment 
of sacred listening uh, in a situation where there are significantly opposing views? What are some of the, the guidelines or the, uh, the ground rules uh, to facilitate listening in a situation where people have different points of view? Well, I think some of the things that, that, that I know work uh, are that, that the, the practice of listening to understand rather than to agree with or believe, having that. Um, because so many times we, when we listen, we think we have to either agree or disagree with what the other person is saying. And I think one of the practices for uh, the sacred art of listening is that to listen to understand rather than to agree with or believe, to, to let go of the judging and the evaluating for that moment and see if we can understand where that other person is coming from. Not defending our own point of view, but sort of just letting go of that for this moment and listening to that other person with, again, curiosity and kind of wonder. Um, one of the other things that I've discovered is helpful in these situations is to Get to really know your own hot buttons. What are the topics that really set you off? And be, be very familiar with them because once they happen in a conversation, and if you're not aware, you'll go off on that tangent. Your emotions will go with that, with that, that point of view. And you will not be able to listen to the other person because your mind will be off on that, particularly your point of view on the, on the, on the situation, rather than listening to that other person to see if you can understand them better. And there are lots of guidelines for dialogue uh, out in the, in, in the world right now. There are just many, many different ones. You, you, it's, you really just, uh, the, the, I would say three that, that, if I could boil it down to just three, I would be listen and speak with respect, uh, listen and speak from your heart, speak for yourself, and listen for understanding rather than to agree with or believe. I think those are kind of the, the major ones that I would say. This question comes from Australia uh, about um, elements of uh, listening that have to do with overcoming cultural differences. How can we overcome a cultural differences that are affect our ability to listen effectively? This question comes up a lot too, and I think that it's an excellent question. And we all live in, in, in culturally diverse communities now, most of us do anyway. Uh, one of the things that uh, I know has helped me is to when I'm, when I'm in a, with someone from a different culture, and I'm not sure how they know that I'm listening to them, I, I will ask them. What is it like for you when, you when you're at home, when you know someone's really listening to you? What do, you, what do, they, what do they do? Because in some cultures, eye contact is important. In other cultures, it's not. And sometimes it's, it's the space between you that is important. And, and other, you know, some people are, are comfortable with being close. Other people are not so comfortable with being close. Um, some, sometimes I think it's, it's just Again, it's these basic things about listening to understand and being open and being curious, being attentive, having that sense of wonder about another person and finding out about their culture and how it works for them. Uh, being aware, this, uh, seeking awareness that we, we need to just constantly be, be curious and seeking that awareness about other cultures. Um, and some of the times it's um, what we can do is, is if you don't know, is to mirror the other person's behavior so that you, they can, you can kind of, in, in a way, you embody that behavior. And then that might help you understand that culture a little bit better as well. But it, it's something that's an ongoing practice, again, is to be with people from different cultures and find ways to connect with them. One of the things I've discovered personally over the years is that heart listening works beyond any culture. If we listen to each other from our hearts, we don't need to worry so much about the other uh, other differences that we have in our cultures because we do connect. When, when uh, there's a, uh, an anonymous quote that says, when hearts connect, angels sing. There's something that happens when we really just let, let ourselves be open to that other person with our hearts and connect with that other person on a heart level. And I've experienced this at, at every parliament I've been to. I've experienced this with people from cultures very different from mine or people from religions very different from mine. 
if I just sit with them and connect with them at the heart level, the, those, the cultural differences become less important and we, we can connect with one human being to another. Thank you. Uh, this question comes from Costa Rica. How does the work of listening apply to social struggles and activism? Well, again, you know, it, 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 it's the this be, being able to be present with other people. Um, I think one of the things that I have learned over the years is that the more I am able to be present, the more I am comfortable with silence, the more I reflect and know about myself, um, the, the more I, effective I can be in my social activism and in my work out in the world, that there are so many, uh, so much to do, there's so much activity engaged and what, what feeds me to do that is to go and to be quiet, to slow down, to reflect, to be in that silence so that I get nurtured, just like I was talking about the, the farmer leaving a field fallow. The more I am nurtured in that way, the more I can go out into, into social activism and the more effective I can be because I'm coming from a very grounded, very centered place rather than a very rushed act of doing, doing, doing all the time. Like it's, it's, a, it's a cycle for me. The more, I, the more I do, the more I need to go back into the silence. The more silence I have, the more it impels me out into the world to be more, be more active. So I think there's that part of it to really work. One listener writes, so when I do listening skills workshops where participants must wait 20 to 30 seconds before responding. People always say in the debrief afterwards that they were uncomfortable to wait before responding for fear of being thought to be ignorant. Yeah, I, I've had this. I've had this too. <laughs> uh, and so what I say sometimes in a, in a social situation, I wouldn't wait 30 seconds. In, in, I would wait five to 10 seconds, which is a very long period of time. And even then, I would say, you know, I really want to reflect on this before I respond to your question, because I want to give you a, 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 my full attention to it. So people appreciate that, so they know that you're not just there with no thoughts in your head at all. Some of the exercises that I do, I do ask people to reflect for 20 to 30 seconds, but that's part of an exercise so that they know that that, that, that um, that's part of it just for that particular period so that it's not so uncomfortable. But we're so used to giving that instant response that it, it's uncomfortable, it's different, it's unfamiliar to just take that time. Just just be, be quiet and see what else comes up other than that first thought. I, I call that head, head speaking. We, we speak from our head and it takes a little bit longer to speak from our heart and we need that time to reflect till we get there. But I think just saying it, you know, um, I I really want to give you my full attention to it. I want to give my full thought to this. So let me let me reflect for a moment or two before. I you know, Kay, so much of communication today is uh, email. Uh, some people still use letters. Uh, there's a lot of nonverbal communication. Uh, how does listening, uh, you know, apply to these kinds of communication? Yeah, we have that. Uh, there's so much that is by email and by well, we're not non 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 face to face communication anymore, and it is it's more difficult then uh, to really because it's it's so hard to know the what the person sometimes they one person can write something and it means one thing and another person can write the same thing. And it means something else to them, so it's just, it's, a, it's a bigger challenge to really listen to that because we don't know. So one of the things that I would I suggest is that we really be, ask, we never be afraid to ask clarifying questions. If we and try not to assume things, uh, those are two very very uh, challenging practices because it's so easy to assume something. And it's so easy to let go, not ask the clarifying question. But I think if, if we are at all a um, little bit hesitant about knowing what, the, what that person means, to just say, you know, when you, I, I read this, and this, this is what I, what, what, what I got out of reading that. Is that what you meant? 
rather than just letting it go or assuming that we know what's in them. So I, I think that it takes it takes more um, uh, on our parts to to listen, but to be again, it's still being fully attentive, really going forward and um, listening in that for that full presence, even on the, in the written word uh, to do that, or in the either whether it's email or texting, just to really keep going with that intention to be present and that intention to understand the other. Can we do this in a collective sense? Is there a way in which groups, say a faith group or an organization, can listen at that level uh, as a group or a collective? Yeah, I think this is possible. I, I, I've seen it happen with, with groups of people. Uh, it, it takes some some practice. Uh, I think we, or training, perhaps, is, is a, a way to talk about it too. But I have seen uh, that that as a group, we can we can we can learn to listen as groups, and and it's, it's that asking those questions again. Dirk, is the kind of question that what wants to be said next? Say say I'm in a meeting, and we're we're kind of trying to come up with some solution to something, and rather than going you know saying what do I want to happen next, or what do I think should, we should do now, saying you know just as a group saying what wants to happen next. And then taking some silence and letting each person in the meeting just reflect for a while. And then saying what it wants to happen next. And then coming up with seeing and that is a, a group listening. And it's a, it's very powerful. This question from Mexico, what do you recommend when trying to listen to somebody whose words are saying something different from his or her nonverbal communication? So again, I think one one thing, one way to be in that in that is to really listen to that, you know, listen beyond the words, because it's you're looking beyond the words there, and and then responding to what you what you're what you're sensing in a very um, gentle, thoughtful way to that person, and saying, you know. I and what you what you said is this. But what I'm sensing is that there's something else here, and then saying what you sense that that is, and see if that's if, if you're right. I mean, maybe that somebody just has a peculiar way of expressing their body. You don't know uh, until you ask. And so I think there's there's really again being being authentic with each other is, is part of that. This question perhaps has to do with uh, the heart of the spirituality of listening, uh, one of the most difficult situations. How do you listen without absorbing anger or negative mm -hmm. emotions from someone else? That's a, a, a great question. And it, it's one that I, 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 I struggle with. And, it's, but, and I've noticed that by having doing these daily practices, by really having incorporated silence, reflection, and presence in my daily life, that I can listen to someone and let go of my my defense, let go of of, of what I might want to say, my agenda, and just simply let them let them say what they have to say, and and knowing that it's not. It's not about me. It's, it's about so I don't need to take it on. That I can simply be that present and listen to them. And 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 there are people. Um, this isn't quite the same question, but there are people that um, I find that I can only listen to for a certain amount of time, um, for whatever reason. It, it's nothing to do with them. It's more to do with me and my my own energy level or something. But um, and I will, for those people, when I've learned, I will say that you know that when they when they want to have a conversation with me, I will I will say, yeah, I've got I've got half an hour today. I can listen to you for half an hour, or whatever whatever my my uh, my my level of of being able to listen to them is. 
and, and do it that way so that I'm not cutting them off. But I'm, I'm noticing also that there are some people that I find I cannot listen to for more than half an hour or so. It just it, for, for reasons that probably have more to do with me than with them. But um, that seems to work for both of us in those situations. Well, Kay, as we uh, come to the end of, uh, of our time with you, uh, I know that uh, you have some additional resources uh, for those uh, listening today. Uh, and we have a few slides here. One is about the handouts. You want to say something? Yeah, I, I have there. On, on, this is my website, and there are two handouts. Uh, if you go on the website, the www.sacredlistening.com, and click on the, the at the top the listening center. Under that, you will find the, the Art of Listening 101, which is a summary of what I've said today, and the top 10 listening tips, which we didn't have time to get into today, but which, which are 10 really simple and uh, things that, that to notice and that to help in practicing the the sacred art of listening that I think you'll enjoy. So they're just there to be downloaded. And then I do have uh, the books that I've written on listening, The Sacred Art of Listening, which is also published in, in Germany and in India and in Slovenia in Spain and the UK. So that's available pretty globally. And then my, the second book I wrote, uh, which is Practicing the Sacred Art of Listening, which really is a much more practical. The first one is about sort of 40 uh, reflections and different ways to think about listening. And this one is much more the actual practices and some more ideas about exercises that you can do to um, practice the sacred art of listening. And then the, the third book is about for children. It's called How Does God Listen? And it's for children ages 3 to 6. And it's a, a picture book that uh, has answer, response to the question about how does God listen through the senses. It's, it's a fun book. It's got some beautiful pictures in that a friend of mine took. Okay, thanks for the way in which you've devoted uh, uh, your work uh, to this important uh, aspect of communication and uh, the way in which you've been so generous in sharing it with those in the interreligious movement and, and with us today. We want to thank everyone for joining us for this talk with Kay Lindahl. Uh, please join us for our next webinar on May 9th entitled Interface Social Media Interfaith Leadership in the Digital Age with Frank Fredericks. We also invite you to stay connected to the Interreligious Movement through our email newsletter and by visiting our social network at peacenext.org. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website within the next few days if you'd like to review it or share it with others. The vision of the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions is of a more just peaceful and sustainable world. The Council works to cultivate harmony among the world's religious and spiritual communities and to foster their engagement with the world and its guiding institutions. For years, the Council has creatively and concretely worked to link the interreligious movement from the local to the global. And we send our thanks to all of you who are doing your own part for a better world. Again, on behalf of the Council, thank you for joining us today.